speak a bit about osteotomies around the knee, evaluation of patient, preoperative planning. Uh, me and Krishan go a long way back. We've been uh, working together, collaborating, and uh, there are uh, uh, there are a few surgeons I must uh, say I look up to to learn new things and uh, uh, just why to be as expert as uh, they are. And Krishan is uh, one of them. So uh, it's great to see you again, Krishan. Okay, so uh, let's let's uh, have a quick look at uh, how you can use osteotomy as a tool to correct various deformities, treat arthritis. I'll also uh, discuss a couple of cases to make it more interesting. And uh, let, let's uh, see what we are trying to do. We're trying to get the knee uh, with a deformity such as this, where the weight-bearing axis is passing on the medial side with various arthritis and convert that to a straight knee where the Nicholas point or the uh, weight-bearing axis passes on the lateral part of the joint which will offload the medial compartment. So that's our main goal. So our main goal is to realign the joint. And this has been, this has been known right from the days of uh, William McEwen from Scotland, who uh, sort of is the pioneer in osteotomy in about say, 18th century as such. It's a very powerful tool, the osteotomy, and it's moreover, it's more versatile than, than you can think about. You can change the axis or change the alignment in coronal plane, sagittal plane, as well as rotational planes. And you can even change the slope. So you can play with the ACL and PCL deficient knees as well. So your aim here is to unload the damaged area of the knee joint and retention the ligaments, improve movements and as an adjunct to other procedures as well. The most important question is which bone and what correction you will achieve. So I always give this uh, example of leading tower of Pisa and you can you need to do a proper deformity analysis to decide what kind of correction is required. And a simple closing weight osteotomy like this will get it perfectly straight. Of course, it won't work here, but that's if plated properly will work perfectly in the bones. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, anyone who's interested in uh, working further with osteotomies need uh, to make himself or herself uh, aware of a few books which are very important in understanding and this last book from AO Foundation is really, really useful to understand about osteotomies around the knee and how to plan the surgeries. Now, the first and most important step in osteotomy is planning. And planning is done on a scanogram. Scanogram is a standing X-ray of the lower limb all the way down from the pelvis to the foot or feet. And it shows the alignment of the legs. So the key words here is getting the patellae forwards, not the feet forwards, but the patellae forwards and get a calibrated x-ray on which you can plan your correction properly. I normally go for digital planning in most of my surgeries. So uh, the images I will show will have uh, the, the trauma CAD or uh, pre-op planning uh, software applied, which shows the correction you are going to achieve. So this is how your normal scanogram looks. And those who know me know my desktop is littered with uh, images such as this of all the patients that I do HTO or osteotomies for. Now, before we go into details of uh, what correction and which bone, the important thing to know are the basic axis that we need to talk about when you are planning. So we know the joint line axis. We know about the mechanical and the anatomical axis of the femur and the tibia and the various valgus angle is calculated based on uh, where these uh, axes intersect each other. Now, Drawer Palais was instrumental in sort of uh, uh, making these angles more known to most of the orthopedic surgeons. And what we're interested in is these two angles, the, the MLDFA and the MMPTA. So the small prefix M stands for mechanical. So we're talking of the axis between the mechanical axis of the femur and the joint line convergence angle and the mechanical uh, medial proximal tibial angle. Fortunately, both of these are 87 and 88 degrees with a range from 85 to 90. So pretty easy to understand. And these are the two axes which are very important. So center of the femoral head down to the midpoint of the ankle. And you assess where this line intersects the tibial plateau. And that point is called as Nicholas point. Ideally, it should pass through center or uh, based on the normal alignment, any anywhere between uh, 10 to 12 millimeters from uh, the varus side to 10 millimeters to the valgus side. 
So that is the key part where you decide what kind of deformity is there and what kind of correction is required. Now, the most common deformity we all see is the varus arthritis or the medial compartment arthritis. And the correction normally is talked about is the Fujisawa point. Uh, this gentleman is Fujisawa. I've seen various images of Fujisawa, none of them match. So I think this is the real image because this was taken with uh, uh, Ronald Von Hirvodin standing next to him. So the intended correction is generally felt to be around 57 to 58% in a decent joint, but can be increased to about 62, 63% if the compartment arthritis on the medial side is grade four. So there's a bit of variation in the amount of planning you want to do. Now, the various ways in which you can plan your osteotomy, the simplest way is the miniachi technique, where you draw the weight bearing axis from the center of the femoral head all the way to the center of the ankle joint. And this shows a bit of various angulation. Now you draw another line based on where you want that axis to pass through in an intended correct, corrected knee. And that second point that you're marking here is the new center of uh, the ankle joint. The osteotomy usually goes from the lateral part of the uh, tibia, which corresponds to the fibula head, which is about 1.5 centimeter from the joint line obliquely down to the medial side, or you can actually call it reverse. So it goes up from the medial side of the tibia uh, and ends at the hinge point, which is about uh, five to 10 millimeters from the lateral cortex, one to 1.5 centimeters from the joint line, which roughly corresponds to the fibula head. And from that point, uh, you draw uh, another two lines, which join the two ankle centers, the one which is present and one which is future. And this angle is called as angle alpha or angle theta. And this angle is utilized to decide how much correction that is required to get the knee perfectly straight or aligned uh, in the way you want. This is the simplest technique known as miniature technique. Of course, uh, a lot of planning is now done with software. There are various softwares available like Bone Ninja, Osteomaster, uh, trauma CAD and PO plan. So you can use whichever one you're comfortable with. In simple words, if there is a various deformity that usually shows an MPTA, which is less than 85 or LDFA, which is more than 90, then you need to do an osteotomy based on the deformed bone and for valgus deformity, exactly opposite. Now, this is a simple example of how an HTO is done for a, 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 a very typical medial compartment arthritis. And for a severe disease, normally you might need to do a distal biplane osteotomy, which essentially means that you have uh, done the, the, the cut on the tibial tubercle, which is going distal, not proximal. That is to do for the severe corrections. So, you can also, as I said, you can also play with the sagittal plane. So the normal slope is about six to 10 degrees and you can reduce the slope uh, or flatten the joint for ACL deficiency and increase the slope for PCL deficiency. So this is a quick example of uh, someone with an ACL rupture who needed a bit of flattening of the joint. This is an example of someone who had a PCL rupture and underwent uh, a valgizing flexion osteotomy where the slope was increased about 12 degrees from the same for eight, uh, initial four degrees. So these all things can be done to change the alignment in sagittal and coronal planes. You can also change the rotational plane. So for uh, a very unstable patella with a significant intorsion of the femur, you can change the rotation of the femur uh, like, I'm sorry, you can change the rotation of the femur and get uh, the correction uh, in the rotational plane as well. So these are all very powerful things that you can do to rotate the femur. The notion that varus deformity is always in tibia and valgus deformity is always in femur is not right. So you need to measure these angles properly. This is a standard medial compartment arthritis with uh, Varus happening in the proximal medial tibia with an MPT of 82, 82 degrees, and that needed a HTO. And this is a standard uh, valgus deformity in the femur with MLDFA, which is less than 85. So that required a medial closing weight osteotomy. But it can be opposite as well. There are instances where you can find an MPTA which is higher with a varus deformity, and that requires a closing wedge tibial osteotomy. And there are instances when the uh, femoral deformity is present, but there is a various deformity in the, in the joint. So 
you will need to do an appropriate osteotomy based on where the deformity lies. And that's the key part of your planning. That's why you need to measure these angles compared to the normal side or compared to the normal angle and then decide what kind of correction is required for the patient. Sometimes the deformity is so severe that if you correct only on one side, you'll end up with a very severely oblique joint line, which will make it very difficult for the patient to have a standard normal functioning joint. And that will lead to a very fast progressive arthritis. And in such patients, you need to do a double level osteotomy, such as this, to keep the joint line straight or just a joint line flat or more or less parallel to the uh, ground level without compromising with the mechanical axis of the limb as such. So double osteotomies need a different kind of planning where you do one osteotomy and then add a second cora uh, to decide where the deformity is going to be to, to get a perfectly straight leg such as this. Uh, Christian is a bit of an expert in all uh, double osteotomies and he's got a massive series of it. Now, osteotomies are not only done for uh, deformity correction, but they're also done in conjunction with other procedures such as a meniscal repair, a microfracture or a chondral procedure and with multiligament injuries where you need to get the correction in the mechanical axis such in such a way that your uh, other procedure, whether it's a ligamentous procedure, a meniscal procedure or chondral procedure is protected with uh, your osteotomy. And indeed, sometimes your deformity is so bad that you may not be able to get away with a simple knee replacement and osteotomy combined with a knee replacement also is a very attractive way of sorting out deformities. All you need to do is just bypass the deformity and the osteotomy with a, with a rod, uh, with a uh, rod attached to the implants to get uh, an ideally state, ideally fixed and uh, mechanically correct alignment of the leg as such. So after all this, uh, who is the ideal candidate for HTO? So any various deformity in the TVA which is correctable, uh, I don't agree with the 10%, uh, 10 degrees, but uh, uh, I think for standard purposes, you can say up to 10 to 15 degrees uh, of deformity can be easily corrected. More than 10 degrees of fixed pressure deformity is generally more difficult to correct and this requires a bit of post medial release, but still it can be done. Uh, Age is only a number. Most of the papers say uh, under 65 years of age, but uh, I don't agree with this. I think anyone who has an isolated medial compartment arthritis with there is a candidate for uh, medial uh, opening which uh, HTO or whatever deformity is there. Males generally are supposed to be better than females and a, and a BMI less than 30 is better. The most important part is the smoker. I've got a series of patients who are smokers who take much, much, much longer to heal as compared to uh, a normal patient who's a non-smoker. And lastly, but most importantly, you need to have patients who are active and well-motivated. Well it's not as fast recovery as compared to a uni or a total knee replacement, but a well-motivated, well-informed and a patient with a well-performed HTO will do brilliantly in, in, in most of the cases. So isolated medial compartment disease, moderate to severe and with a well-preserved lateral side and decent patriotic more joint will do well. This is slightly an extreme case. This complete loss of medial compartment with collapse and subluxation. So this is slightly more difficult to be corrected with osteotomy, though people have done it. And I'll show you a case of that as well. So this is normally how uh, your planning looks if you're using the TraumaCAD software. So you can actually see the correction you're doing. So uh, this is a first box standard patient that comes to you, 45 year old female with bilateral various deformities. One side is more painful as compared to other. And funnily enough, the less, uh, less various side is more painful for her. So uh, she underwent a staged bilateral HTO. So this is after one HTO performed and you can see the second side uh, was planned for a second. And these patients do brilliantly in most cases. They are able to walk really well. This is three months post the right side HTO. Left is about nine months old now. And they're able to sit cross-legged. They're able to walk. And they're generally very happy with their knee. And she's only 45. So I think she can easily pull on till 65, 70. And she will have a good knee function. This is a slightly more interesting case. Someone who's 28 who fell off a scooty with a... Uh, 
bad twisting injury to the knee. She was seen by a local orthopod and was told that she has a fracture of the proximal tibia and underwent fixation with a, a funny transverse plating of the medial tibial plateau. We all know about your Shaskar classification, but the medial condyle fracture, the Shaskar type 4 is a beast and that's why it's called number 4. That's not club with number 1 or 2, but it's much more severe form of injury. So if you look at her x-ray, it looks pretty innocuous, a, a minor crack, but this was a bad fracture. This that's, that's not her x-ray, but this is what happens when the patient starts weight bearing and this needs a buttress plating. You cannot avoid a buttress plating. You cannot say it's undisplaced and I can just manage it buttress without uh, a proper plating fixation. This is someone I'm operating next week, exactly the same scenario, complete collapse of the medial tibial plaque too, uh, which was managed conservatively, it was undisplaced to begin with. So this lady underwent a weird transverse plating using a recon plate. Uh, it literally went from uh, 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock uh, position. There's no buttress effect and as expected, as would happen, this collapsed. And uh, she presented five months post-op with complete inability to bear weight, a large weird looking scar on the medial tibia, a fixed posterior subluxation with a range of motion from 10 to 100 and significant various deformity. And that was her uh, uh, scanogram. As you can see, the knee is subluxed. As you can see, there is FFD. As you can see, it's completely uh, erect on the medial side. There is collapse. Now, such patients, now such patients ideally are suited for a, a knee replacement, but she's only 28. So I think the problems here are a fixed subluxation uh, in both coronal and sagittal planes with uh, various alignment due to collapse and a stiff knee. So the options for managing such patients are uh, significant uh, release of the posterior soft tissues followed by exit fixation. You can do an intra-article osteotomy to correct the medial collapse. You can do a slope correction or you can just do all of these by doing an HTO with appropriate slope correction. And that is what uh, I intended to do and that's what I did. I did a significant medial release. You can see the PCL fragment there, which is uh, Avals there. I did a significant medial release all the way to the posteromedial corner and did a bit of uh, slope increase. So I compensated for the PCL deficiency by changing the slope of this patient. So you can see the normal uh, gap that is created is, is trapezoidal with the broad part posteriorly in her. The broad part is anteriorly. So I essentially purposely, by purpose, changed the alignment, to change, sorry, change the slope of the tibia to compensate for her uh, deformity and did it work? So that's her about nine months post op, and she's done really well. She got married after that. She's, I think, she's expecting now, but she does mountain climbers better than me now. So this works really well in properly planned patients. So it's important to plan these cases. I, I don't need to emphasize more that surgery is fairly straightforward, but the planning is the key part of this surgery as such. One last case, Chiraga, do I have two more minutes? Okay, it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. okay, so uh, one last, last case, 50 year old chap uh, neglected his deformity for quite some time. Now the x-ray shows uh, a bit of subluxation and thrust while walking. That's his gait, I'm sure. So that's his gait, significant thrust on the right side. See the amount of deformity this gentleman has. So not only is the joint collapsed medially, but it also subluxed slightly. So that's his scanogram. As you can see, there's significant medial collapse. Now, I think he was too far gone even for a medial unicompartmental knee replacement despite being grade four. Uh, the planning showed the MPTA to be about 75, so short by about six, about 13 to 14 uh, degrees as such. And the correction was coming to about 14 millimeter correction. And I still wasn't convinced that's going to work because there was about six millimeter correction happening in the joint as well to compensate for the collapse of the joint. So it was, wasn't matching up to uh, what was intended to be achieved. So we went with open mind. Uh, I decided to combine two procedures, the TCBO, that's tibial condylar valgus osteotomy, along with the HTO. Now, 
when you are struggling to achieve correction, when you think you achieved more than 17, 18 millimeters of correction already with HTO, it, it generally a time to think of adding something, either a DFO or a TCBO to give you a good uh, correction. Now, this was after the HTO was done. I was still sitting very close to the medial um, joint line in terms of the Mikulis point when I was when I was checking it uh, under CR. And I realized that you need to do something more than that. So that's when we, uh, of course, it was planned. That's when we decided to add TCBO to it. TCBO is an, is an osteotomy, which is an L-shaped osteotomy, which goes in the joint at the level of lateral TBL plateau. And the whole medial TBL plateau is raised as a single unit with this. And add to that, you have the power of HTO along with it. So this is the opening that has been achieved in the uh, medial TBL plateau through the L vertical part of the L-shaped osteotomy fixed with a screw, followed by uh, grafting of the main HTO and fixation with a plate. So that's how the knee looks at the end of the operation from where we were. So this is essentially like uh, intra-articular plus extra-articular osteotomy where you're lifting the whole of the medial TBL plateau off. And that works really well. Now, this is how the osteotomy is performed. So there is an L-shaped cut in the proximal tibia. That's the vertical limb and that's the uh, main HTO limb. So there is uh, correction achieving at both uh, the osteotomies at the same time as such. And that's how he is now. After about two and a half uh, months after the surgery, the right is the one which is operated. The left looks a bit uh, in various now. But as you saw, his gait has improved pretty drastically. He's able to wait there uh, easily on the operated leg and the, that leg looks quite straight. He's longer on that side by about half or one centimeter and he's compensating that with a uh, uh, with a shoe raise on the other side. And I'm certain he'll come for a standard HTO for the other side as well. So it's a very robust and versatile tool that can be used to correct deformities in various planes. The important part is to, to analyze the deformity properly. Uh, don't have the attitude of I'll decide on table what I need to do because quite a few times you'll be surprised by the severity of the deformity that you might need to add a double osteotomy and you need to have your DFO kit on table as well. Uh, it can be used as, as an adjunct for ligament insufficiency or meniscal repairs. And the goal is to offload the damaged area and at the same time achieve a desirable mechanical correction. I think like arthroplasty, we are now entering the era of personalized implants and complex osteotomies too. But uh, I think it will take a long time to come to India. And uh, Christian is at the forefront of all of these new, wonderful uh, experimental things that are being done in osteotomy. I hope that made sense. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bushan. Okay. Yeah, now uh, there are a few questions here from, uh, from my colleagues here. Can okay. I take them or uh, uh, does Dr. Ashok Cham have something in the chat box or the question box? You can take them. Yeah, so a uh, couple of things. One, Dr. Bhushan, you uh, in your pre-operative planning, yeah. what, is the, what is the importance of BMI and what is your cutoff for a BMI? See, most of the time when we, when we find this classical case of middle compartment OA, lady about 40, 45 years, invariably 80% of the time they are of high BMI. Yeah. So, so but, but by, by, by standards, we are not supposed to be doing a STO for a high BMI uh, individual. So what do you do in such case scenarios? Do you have any simple tips for us or, or uh, do, you, do you right away reject these patients and second question, yeah. also, what kind of a varus is acceptable for you? Is it, is it, if somebody is more than, more than 15 to 20 degrees of varus, would you still go ahead and offer them a high tibial osteotomy or, or do you have some other modalities of going ahead with this? So to start with your first question, I think if a person is walking with his body weight, then he or she can walk afterwards also. So I don't reject any patient for osteotomy. But I have a frank and open discussion with them and tell them the longevity of your operation reduces drastically if you're overweight. 
if your bmi is more than 35 i will probably advise them to visit a bariatric surgeon uh, to see if they can lose some weight uh, get an assessment done by endocrinologist if there is any hormonal imbalance but there are certain patients who still say that i eat only uh, one chapati in a day i still get fat without eating or drinking anything now if that's the case i think uh, you have to take them by for it and uh, do your operation so i always tell them and i write in my consent form also because of high bmi longevity of the surgery is reduced my only uh, criteria for rejection for hto is if someone is on regular oral steroids the chances of infection are quite high in them and if someone is smoker i try and tell them to at least stop smoking for 3 months uh, around the surgical time about your second question severity of rs is only a number i think uh, with the powerful tool of a double osteotomy or combining tco and hto you can easily go up to 20 degrees of varus correction and uh, uh, the highest limit i've done till about 21 degrees of varus correction and uh, i think beyond that uh, is slightly tricky maybe krishan has some tricks that he can share with us about uh, severe deformity correction but i think 15 to 20 degrees is more than uh, what you can uh, correct with combining osteotomy so a plain hto i think will not go beyond 15 degrees because beyond that the insa becomes completely insufficient and uh, your fixation also becomes uh, slightly in your body so 15 degrees for my normal correction and uh, 20 degrees for combined hto da4 or tcvo hto Hello. Anybody around? The digital appliance. I don't have a product connection. Now, what is the difficulty you find, and what is the more accurate? Hello. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Doctor Bushan. Yeah, sorry. Uh, we have a couple of questions pouring in here. Uh -huh. uh, the first question is like uh, we, we have always the Fujisawa point has been the gold standard for corrections in HTOs and uh, and and in any sort of preoperative planning. Now we have moved towards the Miyake technique and and uh, so on and so forth. Now, do you do you feel that there's any discrepancy, or do you feel uh, which one is? better i according to you you are you are a strong believer of of uh, your uh, miniaki way of uh, calculating your correction scope so but i always uh, calculate uh, my but, correction pre operatively yeah. using a digital software i don't use miniaki technique i normally use a trauma cat software or osteo master software um, i think fujisawa point as we told now and again is a misnomer fujisawa meant for 67.5% and not 62.5% when he Uh, mentioned the Fujisawa point. Uh, based on whatever we know, as long as we push the knee in valgus, the patients are generally happy and they get good ten years of uh, pain-free function without progression of arthritis. I think at present, fifty-five, fifty-seven percent is uh, I won't say gold standard, but it will be useful for uh, getting the knee in a decent alignment without causing too much of load on the lateral on the lateral compartment. Uh, that usually corresponds to the lateral tibial spine. So I normally take them to the scope of the lateral tibial spine, slightly lateral to the tibial uh, lateral tibial spine. That usually corresponds to anything between 55 to 60 percent of uh, 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 correction or position when measured from medial to lateral on the medial disc point. And there is a very practical question here coming up from the from 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 one of our senior colleagues. See, lot. Can you hear me, Doctor Bushan? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, not everywhere you are accessible to a scanogram. Okay. Uh, suppose even in the city, I'm not only talking about even in the city. Uh, most of most of us do not have the stitch software. Okay. In the in the hospitals. So, what is the ultimate you have as a pre-operative? I'm not talking about an intraoperative uh, uh, planning of your corrections. So, pre-operative okay. planning. Do you have any uh, plan B? so uh, another way of getting a crude scanogram is to get a x ray of the pelvis standing x ray of the pelvis a standing x ray of the uh, with a, on a large film a standing x ray of the knees uh, 
from mid femur to mid shin and then another x ray of the mid shin down to the ankle in a standing position with legs in a neutral rotation with patella pointing forwards and you can physically stitch them together the same thing is done by radiographers when they do it digitally also so you can just staple the x rays together and then you can draw your correction on uh, on those images with a tracing paper and that works really well believe me you can have the image and you can uh, mark your uh, mark your body architecture and decide what kind of correction can be done it does require a bit of effort from our side but that way you will be certain of what you are achieving Yeah, I think uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Bhushan, for for your wonderful inputs, and thanks for your wonderful talk. Uh, now, Dr. Ashok, sir, are you here? I'm here. Yeah, I think uh, we can move over to the uh, next topic. Yeah, we can. Dr. Prashant, can we yes. can we hear from you? Of course. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation, and uh, well, <laughs> thanks thanks for the beautiful. I have an echo here. Can we um, you somewhat reduce the echo? Otherwise, I have to just mute my. It's quite severe. Now it's better. Perfect. No, no, it's no no problem. If everyone's muted now, that's that works like that, I guess. So thanks for the invitation again. Um, and thanks for the uh, perfect introduction and uh, and lecture that we've heard already, which covers almost everything. Um, but anyhow, the the topic is insane and it's it's very intense. So um, it it does really make sense to stress some of these points over and over again. And a little bit of redundance um, isn't isn't a bad thing here. So I will now share my screen. Um, there are some quite good apps in between that that screen share now is enabled. Uh, there are some quite good apps actually that help you to, um, for example, um, stitch images. So plain images such as Bushen uh, just uh, just said. So there is some some apps you cannot see the screen like this one here. It's called uh, Pick Two R X P. So it's a very I, I guess it cost me one one quid. <laughs> and I'm able to stitch images with this. So if you don't have uh, access to scanographs that will allow you to make a uh, whole leg standing x-rays, then this may help you out. Anyhow, let's dive into it. Um, I've um, put together some aspects for high tibial osteotomy, distal femoral osteotomy, and thrown it all together to cover some aspects of uh, double level osteotomy, such as Bushen already did. Um, but I may throw some lights on uh, on other aspects here. Um, whenever you have any questions in between, just interrupt me, ask me, I give you direct answers to that. Should be rather uh, interactive. So let's start with the scanograms and uh, the whole leg X-ray uh, orientation. And what is actually an AP um, uh, long leg standing X-ray? So we should look at different things. One thing is the patella orientation, which is often given as the paramount for a long leg orientation. As a matter of fact, I always thought that the patella is probably the most mobile bone that we find around the knee. So therefore it may not stand as the ideal marker for uh, what an AP image really has to look like. Um, but anyhow, you should point it somewhat to the middle. If you then do this, um, you can see, such as we see it here, that the limb alignment changes drastically if you take your patella forward or not. But what you can see as well on this image or video footage here is that also the position of the fibula head changes drastically. So what really is an AP image is a one third coverage of the femur femoral head, uh, fibula head, sorry, and what what you also see is the change of the shape of the femoral condyles. So the femoral condyles should look straight at you, such as we see here. So, um, or we should see here actually. So this is the patella pointing forward. This is a one third coverage of the fibular head. 
And the femoral condyles should not be square, but look straight at you. So that's an AP image. So a little bit of history. Um, it was in fact, as Bushin said, uh, Johan Mikulic um, from today Ukraine, who was a real grandmaster of orthopedic surgery. Um, and uh, well, he described in his thesis paper, the individual shape differences of the femur uh, and the tibia um, of the human skeleton uh, under special uh, consideration of the static of the knee joint. So that's what's written there. Sorry for uh, that being German, but anyhow, what he made, he measured it all with silk threads, uh, taking specimens that, um, that he had uh, for his cadaveric setting and um, he measured and, and summed it all up in tables and make a, made a remarkable um, scientific work out of it and described the MLDFA being the mechanical lateral distal femur angle and assumed that the, um, that the tibial uh, measurements would be um, the alternating angles to 180 degrees and therefore um, uh, hypothesized then uh, that the lateral proximal tibia angle is the alternating angle to 180. So he, in contrast to Paley, did not describe the MPTA, but the LPTA. But in general, that all was described 150 years ago and was always there. Um, and that is written here. So this is basically the part out of the thesis paper, but that's all in German. So that all brings us to these standard measurements. And we have seen that already. What we take a look at is this part in the middle, the MLDFA and the MPTA. And as Bushan said, all, both of them are approximately 87 with a range from 85 till 90. And we need to take a look at both of them individually in order to find out where the true malalignment is, but it may not be um, in the femur or in the tibia, it may be in both, but it may also be in between, which is expressed by the joint line convergence angle. And we will come back later to this because that is of importance when we go to the correction of our correction. So once again, this is the Paley drawings, MLDFA, MPTA. This is really precisely what you have to take a look at and you have to do this in each and every case. So now let's go quickly through such a planning as we have seen before, but I want to make it a little bit more step-by-step -step chronologically. So the, you, the first thing you do is you draw in the Mikulic line from the center of the femoral head to the center of the ankle joint and get your Mikulic line, which is the not the weight-bearing line because the weight-bearing goes rather from the center of the pelvis. This is then um, the Direktionslinie or direction line. So, and then you draw in your virtual Mikulic line, which gives you the forecasted position of the Mikulic line at the end of the surgery. and well, may this intersect the tibia at some kind of a Fujisawa point or elsewhere. This is um, a matter of debate. Um, as you have heard from Bushan already, we don't go to this uh, Fujisawa point anymore. We routinely plan somewhere in between 55 and 60. We want to really tip over uh, the weight bearing to the lateral side. Anyhow, the very important thing now is to defy a hinge point because this hinge point is now the center of the osteotomy where everything moves around. So it's now very tricky for some colleagues really to, to, um, to get an idea on what to do next and where to draw next lines, et cetera. Um, so it becomes all very simple when you just see these two lines, the Mikulic line and the virtual Mikulic line, and then you change your position. So you now make yourself the hinge, please, Change your position and, uh, and, and take part, uh, become the hinge. So now if you become the hinge, then you take a look to the actual position where the ankle joint is right now. So you stand yourself right on the hinge, take a look straight where the ankle joint is. And then the next thing is you just turn your head to where the virtual Mikulic line is. And this turning of the head, Basically, the uh, degrees uh, in terms of an angle what, uh, that, that your neck described or your head described to find the virtual Mikulic line. This is your correction. So this is the line A, changing or turning off the head for line B. 
And this line BA describes an angle A, and this is transposed to the medial cortex of the tibia and measured on a calibrated X-ray in order to translate this wedge base or the angle that you have to a wedge base height in millimeters. And this is what you equip yourself with and go into the OR. Now, I was asked to tell a little bit about the surgeries themselves. So this is not the planning, but obviously this is an uh, incremental part of everything. So let's go to the surgery. So the first part, which is important, is the positioning of the patient. So the patient lies on the back um, and uh, you need a little bit of support at the side and a foot pulser, a roll, just to be able to place the limb at approximately 90 degrees of position. When extended, the foot should rest five centimeters above um, the end of the table in order to be able to kind of direct it and to apply pressure to simulate during the surgery um, what happens when the patient takes load. So five centimeters over the edge of the, of the table is, is a good measurement. We have something that we call the belly technique. So the assistant stands at the distal side of the table, puts the, the foot of the, of the patient on his belly, basically, and then without using the hands, having two hands free, can manipulate the position and the orientation a little bit by just maybe making some moves in order to facilitate everything. So this is when you have a one helper method to carry out the surgery because you have two other hands of your assistant free. So the first thing you do is you uh, defy your hinge point as set and therefore you need a K wire to shoot there. Well, where to shoot this K wire now? Where is this hinge point? Well, the safest part that you have at this proximal part of the tibia is actually the junction in between the fibula head and the tibia. So this is, imagine the, the fibula head is like a hand holding it and all the fibers that go across from this joint. Sometimes when you divide it or you want to divide this during surgery, you really need to have a chisel in order to separate these fibers. It's very strong, this construct, and therefore it's described as the safe zone by Korean colleagues. So this is basically the pillar that holds up everything. You must not be too low not to create Takeuchi fractures going down, basically uh, creating a very unstable construct, but also not too high, not to, um, not to be in, under risk, creating an intraarticular fracture. So this safe zone is just the right one. Um, and we always said, um, um, you shoot the head from the head, which is obviously very German English, you shoot the head off the head. So I've learned something now over the last couple of months being in England. So shoot the head off the head is the correct term. Anyhow, um, let's go further here. Um, the next thing you do is you, you defy the level of osteotomy. I started with 2K wires back then. I don't do this anymore because I thought another trick now, I thought it's very hasslesome to shoot them all parallel to the slope. So what is way easier is you take one K wire, shoot it at the right spot. Then you take your saw blade and orient your saw blade under fluoroscopic control. So, and once you resemble the slope, you just make the first shot into the medial cortex. And once this first medial cortex incision is performed by just half a centimeter, the orientation in terms of slope reproduction of the saw blade is fixed. So you cannot change it anymore. And then you just run on rails and follow the K-wire that you shot to determine your high tibial osteotomy. Very simple. Don't use two K-wires anymore. Apart from that, if you use the threaded tip ones to shoot it at a very particular point, and I recommend you to do this, use threaded or drill tips better than threaded tips because a threaded tip just runs wherever it wants to. Um, a normal K-wire without any tip preparation um, basically is sometimes hard to be placed at the correct spot, but a drill tip is just ideal. So you can use a drill tip um, or should use a drill tip, but these are very expensive. So it's easier to take one or at least cheaper at the very end. So um, then you can perform your osteotomy under irrigation, as you see here, I don't do this, and you should protect your medial collateral ligament. And as you see here, that was... Um, 
kind of it's it's almost an ancient uh, in, in illustration right now that you see here because what we have done we came from ventral of the medial collateral try to peel it back to get exposure of the medial aspect of the tibia and then protect the posterior aspect it's completely impossible because the medial collateral ligament is rather anterior as the 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 shape of the of the tibia at that particular height is um, is a triangle, and it's it's basically on uh, on one part of the triangle which is anterior. So you need to revert that and peel it back all the way uh, to get access to the straight posterior part of the tibia. That's impossible. I will show you in an illustration that this doesn't work. And you, if you want to protect the posterior parts, then you need to basically go from the back of the medial collateral ligament. Another novelty that I, and a trick that I share with you makes it all very simple. In order to get to this medial collateral ligament and hold away the pass tendons, it's way easier to do it in 90 degrees of flexion. So make your preparation and the surgery itself or the dissection and holding back of the pass in 90 degrees of flexion, and then you can Place all your retractors and carry out your cut and pull extension under fluoroscopic control. Very simple like that. So then you make your ascending cut or your descending as Bushen uh, described and open everything with chisels like this alternating um, chisel um, technique. Very handy, very useful. Uh, I described another one, which is basically quite new that makes it even easier. And uh, you will see that in the video in a short while. Then you hold your osteotomy open with an osteotomy spreader and fix everything after you've controlled and checked that the alignment is an appropriate one and you um, intersect the tibia at your planned uh, intersection point. So now what to do with the MCL is one question that most uh, colleagues have. How to prevent neurovascular injury that's also a very often asked question and the hinge protection is for most of the colleagues very important. So now these three aspects can be, can be dealt with quite easily and I will get you through that in order to show you some tips and tricks. Now this is the part that we have spoken already and this is the posteromedial aspect of the, of the knee and the high tibial area where we carry out our osteotomy. So this is in green now, the surface of the oblique cut without the biplanar. So this is the posterior aspects, um, uh, the popliteus muscle and uh, the popliteal artery with this high riding um, branch that in some 10% of the cases is there and it goes basically in between bone and popliteus muscle. So if you cut, no matter how well you protect it, um, you, will, you will hit this artery. And this bleeds like a radial artery. It's a disaster. So you cannot see anything. So the only, only tackling that you then have is basically to hyper open the osteotomy and coagulate it through the osteotomy gap, which obviously sets your hinge, hinge under, under risk of fracture. So you should not do this and you can avoid it by just dealing with it. So now here you see um, a transverse image of uh, the osteotomy height. So if you look at now um, the popliteus muscle and you see uh, that the medial collateral ligament is rather in the front and you need to really peel it all the way back in order to come down to uh, where you want to be at in between the muscle and the, and the cortex in the back in order to protect this high riding um, division this branch that in 10% of the cases is there, you need to come from the back of the medial collateral ligament. Nothing is easier than that. Then you can insert a retractor. We've designed new retractors back then. This was an, a retractor from, uh, from Synthes, but we will bring another one from uh, Nuclip. And I will now get you through the, the video of the latest technique of the HTO. Bushan, do you see and hear everything? Can you give me a thumbs up for that if you hear it? Okay. So the good thing about this voiceover is I have now three minutes where I can rest. Can't hear you, Christian. 
Can you hear this video? Can't hear. Can't hear the video. You can't hear the video, but you see the video? Yeah. Okay, so then I just give you a voice over for it. So this is the insertion of the retractor posterior to the um, to the medial collateral ligament. And that protects the neurovascular structures. So now you see a release of the medial collateral and a Holman retractor that peels it back so that you get access to the medial tibia. So then you shoot your K-wire as said, like a rail, just one K wire and carry out the, uh, the, the first osteotomy cut up to like one centimeter before the uh, contralateral cortex. And then the ascending cut is carried out. So now the biplanar osteotomy is done and you, you check the stability of the construct. Now there is a novel method of spreading the osteotomy. And this is um, introduced with these um, ball pins that you can shoot at either side of the osteotomy and spread them with an osteotomy spreader, which is specifically designed for that because it has pre-manufactured holes in the distal ends of the arms. So you see now the positioning and now you see the spreader. You can also use a McGill but this spreader is really very, very strong. So you can open up now the osteotomy without any chisels. And the ball pins give you the guarantee that it moves in a spherical way. So you don't have any irritations in uh, terms of dislocations. And the best thing is you don't have anything in your way if you want to graft it because the osteotomy gap is completely free of any osteotomy spreader. So as you have that, you just hyper open it by like one or two mils over the, uh, over the uh, um, anticipated um, osteotomy height, put in a bespoke wedge, and then you let it fall back on the bespoke wedge and check your orientation. So that's a very, very versatile technique, very handy, works for many osteotomies, not just high tibial osteotomies, and then you apply your plate as seen here. So uh, there will be um, a specific kit for this technique in the not too near future, okay? So obviously you can do this now yourself. Um, you can have some balls that you just slide on. There is ball pins on the market. The only thing you need is something like a McGill uh, that you can put over it with very strong arms to open it, but we will bring out a kit for this. So the next thing, that is the opening of the osteotomy and the carrying out of the cuts um, in a safe fashion in order to have some neurovascular protection and to deal with the medial collateral ligament. So the next thing that we see is, or that we are often asked is, what about the hinge protection whilst opening and after the procedure? Well, there was a very, very clever concept by the founder of Nuclip, um, a company uh, that uh, produces orthopedic plates and screws and, and tools and uh, everything. But anyhow, the founder of the comp company is, is a, well, has some devotion for osteotomies about the knee. And he thought, well, why don't we just shoot a K wire temporarily in order to hold everything in place? And my good friend from, um, from Marseille, Mathieu Olivier, well, he basically made, along with uh, Sébastien Parrette, he made some signs uh, on um, the stability of a hinge wire. And they found that, well, I don't really believe in 80, 880%, but there is a drastic, a drastic improvement in terms of hinge stability if you have this wire in place. So you can really do crazy stuff and move uh, the hinge like you see here. So that's really very, very stable. And well, I thought myself, well, if this hinge, well, here you see the founders of the idea uh, all in person, but I thought if this hinge is that stable like this, why don't we, based on this biomechanical study from Mathieu, um, put in something that enables our patient to directly weight bear after the osteotomy. So at day one, Obviously they can anyhow, if they are pain-free, but I found out that they are 
that the likelihood of becoming pain free is even higher if you introduce something that we call a hinge screw. So you perform the osteotomy and save the osteotomy with a screw that basically runs from outside in because it's way easier to aim for it. And so this is what we introduced, a, a hinge screw um, that basically compresses now the osteotomy hinge the first time ever after such a, such a surgery because the normal way of compressing it goes via the plate and the pre-bending of the plate. So this is basically um, an, a, a passive uh, non-dynamic compression, whereas this is here an active dynamic compression with a hinge screw. So um, let's go further. So this is the, um, the study from Fujisawa, where he basically uh, examined some 45 knee joints. And you see that, I mean, for Indian circumstances, th this is what you do uh, at the afternoon. So um, this is not really a study with a huge number and, um, and 45 knees is now everything that we tailor all our surgeries, our high table osteotomies on um, to, to guide or to, to place the, the intersection point of the Mikulic uh, line, the virtual Mikulic line at the end of the surgery. Anyhow, um, mostly it's said that this intersection should be at 62% of the tibial plateau width measured from the medial side. And this is something that um, Fujisawa never emphasized and, um, and Bushen already told you this. So uh, Fujisawa measured both parts of the tibia, uh, the medial and the lateral half and said it's best if it's like uh, in between 30 and 40% of the lateral aspect, which would then be trans translated to the measurement from the medial side in terms of percentage of the tibial plateau width at 65 to 70%. So this is quite far lateral. And for most of us, this is rather considered to be palliative surgery, because if you want to bring it to this part, then you need to really open the tibia quite drastically. And in some cases, you really overdo it. As we said, our pre-assessment for the surgery is that we see a tibial varus and then you want to correct it. And well, how to, de how to detect a tibial varus? Well, we know that it's lower than 85 MPTA. So, but if you start, let's say with, a nine, uh, with an 84 MPTA, and then you have to open it by some 15 millimeters, then you end up most probably with a post-operative MPTA of 100 degrees. And this is, 10 above the normal. So you create with these high tibial osteotomies, just for the sake of putting Mikulic to the desired spot, you create a malalignment, which is even worse than the patient started with, just to the opposite side. So this is why I explain to my colleagues mostly that this is regarded palliative surgery. What we want to do is we want to get it right. So an HTO is something which is great for a patient who has a massive uh, varus deformity at, I don't know, 82. And a Mikulic line that sits somewhere in his mid medial uh, compartment. Whenever the Mikulic line does not touch the knee anymore, next tip, as a rule of thumb, if it goes medial to the, to the knee joint, then it's mostly a double level osteotomy. So then you need to distribute your overall amount of correction to the femur and the tibia. And if you measure it up, you will find that mostly you have the malalignment in both bones. In our own series in Hanover, in some, well, it was some five, no, it was some, it was some seven years ago now, basically, we checked our own uh, results of, um, of our osteotomies um, by just finding out uh, about the, about the, the sheer amount of surgeries we did for the femur and the tibia. And we have seen that 99% of our osteotomies just for the ease of the procedure we carried out at the tibia. But the measurements, the analytics told us that 20% of the malalignments were originated in the femur. In other words, we treated 19% of our patients at the wrong bone. And that obviously wasn't a very comfy situation. So we changed our practice and reached results that were basically rather um, 
uh, in line with the ones published from Babis. I will show you this later on. And you get way more satisfied patients if you follow this regime. Uh, in fact, double level osteotomy may, may be considered uh, because you look at it and you say, well, this is double surgery, meaning double trouble. In fact, it's double surgery, half the trouble because you just get things right. That's the most important aspect. So if you look at one of these images out of the Fujisawa publication, look at this one here, then you see that the post-operative MPTA in this case is probably close to 100. And this causes shear forces and that leads to early deterioration. Surprisingly, I've, uh, I've looked through this, or I read through this publication and, um, and uh, Fujisawa himself cited in his reference list under 26, Johan Mikulic, the thesis paper from 1878. I mean, even back then when there was no internet and anything available, um, they, they cited themselves um, uh, throughout uh, over the, the language gaps and everything. And I think this is remarkable and what kind of work these colleagues uh, put into uh, and their scientific uh, collaboration is just remarkable. So anyhow, um, there are other guys uh, like Duckdale and Noyes, who then later on came with a different aspect of not correcting up till uh, 65 to 70 percent, because maybe for themselves it was a little bit too far. They made their own um, scientific approach to that. But, um, well, how did they find out where to put it? Well, the, the, the paper gives you a quote for that. The authors empirically selected a 62 to 66 percent weight bearing. Uh, intersection point. Well, empirical selection does mean there was no base for that. It was just set. So um, in fact, this is the paper that where these 62% intersection comes from. So there is no scientific backing for that. And why not just think over and, and getting things anatomically right? So this is the best answer we can have for our patients is to, to, to put anatomy where it where it has to be. And we know about where it has to be because we have all these measurements from Mikulic back then confirmed by Paley later and so on and so on. So um, Mathieu Olivier from, from Marseille even uh, uh, regards these measurements, checked the skeleton from Lucy found from millions years ago and basically she had the same alignment. So we, we cannot improve nature here because there is a biomechanical sense in, in these three degrees of uh, medial inclination. And I will show you where this, uh, where this biomechanical sense is. And if you understand that, then you will not come across any of these absurd ideas to overcorrect, undercorrect whatsoever. You just have to correct to the right point and that's it. And this may differ from patient to patient, but it's all, always a three degree inclination of the joint line. So it's not only the Mikulic line, next tip, it's not only the Mikulic line that you need to take a look at, it's also the joint line orientation. And if you get these two together, then the results will be superior because you must not, you must not correct to something which looks like this at the end of the surgery. This is an MPTA which goes way too high to 100 degrees and there's this nonsense. What happens if you do this? Well, you can see it here. This is basically a correction carried out at the tibia. And if you look at the tibia, there was never a, a malalignment to it, but the patient was basically indicated with an MP, with a an, uh, high tibial osteotomy, resulting from an already normal MPTA to a completely unnormal MPTA. The true problem though, the MLDFA from 100 degrees was never tackled. So therefore, this patient was revised early because of the shear forces leading to early deterioration. And this is obviously a very, very complex total knee implantation. So this is where all these statistics come from uh, when, when colleagues, accuse, um, uh, colleagues accuse HTO of being very complex as far as revision to total knee is concerned. Well, obviously it is. If you get the anatomy completely wrong, then it's always tricky surgery. But if you prepare your patient by just picking the right bone and bringing anatomy to its normal means, then the uh, conversion to a total knee is as easy as stealing a baby candy. So, um, 
As a matter of fact, this is the wrong idea. As Bushen said already, you need to measure, measure, and analyze. And as said, we treated ourselves 20% of our patients at the wrong bone. Now let's say if we did that, then you need to take the femur into the game. And let's do that now. So let's look how such a planning of a femur looks like. Well, you do the same as we did for the HTO. The only thing you do differently is you start from the ankle joint and not from the center of the femur of, at the hip, so of the femoral head. So same thing, you start at the ankle joint, you draw your two lines, whereas in this case, there is no overcorrection, no tipping point. You just choose the center of the, of the knee. And so then you select a hinge point. And where is that hinge point now? Well, that's the next thing. We traditionally um, used uh, for mechanical purposes, actually, because the blade plate was gold standard and up till now still is, is the most stable plate that we have for, uh, for distal femoral osteotomy. But the plate basically deserved a cut which was horizontal. So most of, of, of the colleagues that were trained years ago uh, in distal femoral osteotomy perform horizontal cuts. Yeah. But Stahelian pointed out that if you want to have cortical support and inherent stability due to the anatomical shape of the osteotomy, you need a rather oblique cut, as you see here. And the hinge, the hinge has to lie on the, on the basically directly uh, on the posterior uh, contralateral condyle. So this is the hinge point. There is a distance though, sometimes the condyle goes quite up high, almost to the flare and meets the flare of the contralateral condyle on the X-ray. When that's the case, so the flare condyle distance is, is small, then obviously there is not lots of bony coverage above the condyle and therefore these patients are risky. So the hinge is under risk in these cases. You can directly say, well, if there is a, a, a very narrow condyle flare distance, I have to be very, very careful with the hinge. But the same counts here. You can shoot some K-wires for during the surgery and apply some screws for maintenance of the correction and the safety of the hinge. So anyhow, it has to be cut like this in an oblique fashion. You see it here again in this illustration, you just choose your, uh, your hinge point, your reference point just directly above the contralateral, um, contralateral condyle. And then you uh, could draw millions of lines, endless lines basically to the starting cortex, but there is just one line that uh, forms a rectangular shape uh, with a tangent um, uh, on, on the cortex. And uh, this is where you have to cut around, take out your wedge, close it, and you can save it, as we said, with this hinge wire. Um, in a biplanar fashion, which was um, instituted by Staubli, the same as for the tibia, um, I recommend you to perform these surgeries in a biplanar fashion. First thing, you never get across the, um, the patellofemoral pouch, as you see here. So the normal osteotomy in a monoplanar fashion crosses the patellofemoral pouch. If you want to avoid that, just go, um, go upwards uh, with your biplanar ascending osteotomy, and you use for the normal osteotomy just the posterior two-thirds or three-quarters. Um, the other advantage of this is you can overall be lower with your osteotomy and therefore be more in the metaphysial area where it heals quicker. And the next thing is you have a second line of defense. If your hinge breaks, then you really come into trouble when you want to really um, uh, reduce the fracture that you created. And with a biplanar, it's really easier. Not saying that it's, uh, that it's easy at all, but it's way easier. So let's proceed with our planning. Uh, we have gone through this. Um, and now once again, um, you have your position. I just enter, uh, I just introduce or put in a little grid, makes it easier for you to follow the three dimensional structure. And once again, if you don't know what to do, well, place yourself over the hinge. Just become the hinge yourself. If you look now from the hinge point and you look from where you are, looking at the rising blue line and where you want to be at, well, you just have to rotate your head again. 
And so this is what you do. Now let's change the position. We are now at the hinge. Now we look at it again from uh, on top position. And if you want to change this and you can just by rotating your head, you can close that. And now we change our position again. And you see it's somewhere in between five and 10 degrees. Well, uh, there is a there is an easy, easy way of doing it. Obviously you shall not do it with such a planning device. This is rather for uh, instructional purposes. As Bushan pointed out, I use trauma cat for this, but this is for the true understanding of everything. You need to learn and understand how the Miniachi method works and how you carry out these plannings. And for this, you need to be able to do it on a, on a paper piece, actually, like um, with uh, copying paper and, and ruler and scissors and everything. So this is what it's all about, understanding, uh, understanding the schematics of everything so that you can do it later on easier with a planning device. We will come to this. So once again, A, B, angle in between, transpose it to the medial cortex, transpose the angle to a measurement matrix. So you measure it on a calibrated X-ray and can transfer this to an osteotomy height. Now let's go for the DFO. So the DFO is, uh, is a great surgery. And uh, well, if you don't have it in your portfolio, you should, should add it. So what you do is you place uh, the limb as set for the tibia so that the foot hangs over. This instruction is completely wrong. So uh, I always place it that the foot hangs over by some five centimeters. And then I make uh, the approach directly over the region of interest. So I always close the femur, or let's say in 99% of the cases I do that because the femur is a brittle bone. It's smaller as far as the diameter is concerned uh, uh, than the tibia at the height of uh, osteotomy. And it's, uh, uh, it's, it's basically the lever arm that comes afterwards is longer. So it's generally under danger. And there is no such figure as the proximal tip fit. So there is no fibers that protect the hinge. So therefore you need to be very, very careful. And um, I personally now do minimally invasive approaches. So I cut directly above the region of interest, either from medial or from the lateral side. I make a mini incision, go to the intermuscular septum and free everything so that I sharply scratch off all the tissues from the back of the femur. So when you then can insert your finger and have it under the femur, you can lift up the whole knee almost with this. And then I shoot not like seen here, four K wires, I shoot two K wires with the same technique that I described you for the tibia already, one K wire for each plane of osteotomy. Then you defy this plane, make the first cuts, and then I shoot a hinge wire before I do my ascending biplanar cut. So this is once again, the schematics of the biplanar, which is way more useful than the monoplanar cut. And then you carry out the correction you see it here, this is the belly press technique, very well illustrated. So then you can simulate everything, check everything, and then you do this, uh, uh, and then you fix the correction. Now you see it here, this is the incision that I do for the normal medial uh, correction. So you go up down to the fascia of the vastus medialis, you see that here, then you incise this fascia. And here you see the muscle popping out. Nicely go to the distal border of the vastus medialis of Lyquis and lift up the whole muscle. So you have it still in its bed and you lift it up. So what you then see at the typical origin or, or height of the osteotomy is these three vessels, the three sisters. And this is where you go with the bovi and free the complete back. Now you see that you can put in your finger to the, um, to the back of the femur. I take this curved big... Um, periosteal elevator and free everything. And if you have this, now then I shoot two K wires, approximately some one centimeter away from the back of the posterior cortex. So, and if you have these two K wires in place, as seen here, hinge point directly on top of the condyle, I rather scratch off like one millimeter of cartilage there than to be too high. 
So then you measure with this caliper, the wedge base height and confirm that everything is appropriate. And then you have to cut it out. So I personally like to use this, uh, this saw, which is the uh, precision saw from Stryker, where just the tip of the saw blade moves, but you can take any other saw, obviously, um, but then you have to cut a little bit broader. The incision uh, is wider then. You perform your cut, take out your wedge, and you see, I don't change the orientation. I keep the same orientation and I control this under fluoroscopy. You see the first cut as one thin line and the saw blade for the second is also one thin line. Then I, we shoot a K wire to protect the hinge. And then we take out this wedge after the ascending cut. The ascending cut is now marked with a bovi so that I see everything. And you see that this all goes through this little three centimeter hole. Might look insane for you because you say, well, um, skin heals from end to end. It doesn't heal from, uh, uh, it doesn't heal from end to end. It heals from side to side. So you don't have to do this. Well, you're right, but it's like, it's what the patient sees at the end. So this is one aspect. And the other aspect is you must not really elevate the whole of the, of the vastus fiber. So here you see the taking out of the wedge. That's the wedge. Then you can gently, by repetitive introduction of the saw from the hinge point on, which is basically protected because you cannot protrude further than the K wire allows you, the hinge wire, you can uh, gently close it by repetitive introduction and milling all the remnants away with a saw blade. So then you see a plate introduction. I changed my plate to the one from Euclid, but anyhow, this video comes from former times. It's now here in place. And then you fix this plate and uh, make a fluoroscopic control. And then uh, I fix it in the proximal aspect. The next tip here is to take some trocar, some cannula. And you can also use and apply this trick for any kind of trauma surgery because it gives you a safe access to the femur and a repetitive access to the femur without going through the muscle over and over again to not create to create some muscle hashi at the end and have some, some destroyed fibers there. Um, so I fix the plate, make a lateral X-ray in order to check it. And when everything looks like here, well, then I just introduce screws. So that's it. We put in some screws. Another option here, once again, as you have seen, as you have seen for the tibia, you can put in a hinge screw. Once the hinge, hinge screw is inside, is really way more stable. So this is now the scientific backing for why do I do it in a minimal invasive fashion? Well, Farouk pointed out years ago, two decades in Hanover back then, um, that it makes sense to minimally invasive uh, the plate uh, um, and do the osteosynthesis because the MIPO, minimally invasive, in comparison to um, conventional plate osteosynthesis, shows way better periosteal perfusion, in fact, 100%, and better intraosseous perfusion. So it makes sense not to really um, uh, skeletonize your, your bone if you want to bring it to healing. And healing is transported by blood supply, and blood supply can just maintain if you don't destroy the blood supply by, um, by uh, skeletonizing everything. So that doesn't make sense. So now here comes the biomechanical backing for what we have talked about as far as um, a double level osteotomy is concerned. So the normal joint line orientation is an inclination of three degrees, which is basically resembled in 87, 87, and we learned this. So why is it now the case that this is so? Because as a matter of fact, we all know that cartilage can withstand shear forces quite easily, um, uh, shear forces uh, not very easily, but pressure quite well. So why is it oblique if it cannot withstand shear forces that introduces shear forces and that's completely insane? It's counterintuitive. So, but now let's take a look at how we walk. In the normal ease standing position, we have these oblique joint lines. At attention position, when we jump, run, hike, we basically medialize our feet because you want to have it under the center of mass. And this is 
seen here. So that's the normal alignment, ease position, standing 50% of your body weight on, one, on, on each foot, actually. But if you now transfer this to a dynamic construct and medialize your foot because you want to have it centered under your pelvis in order to gain balance, then you have five times your body weight on one limb. And this is when the oblique joint line is truly horizontal. So if you want to have it horizontal when it counts, then you need to have an oblique joint line. Otherwise, it's not. So therefore, you need to reproduce these three degrees of oblique joint line if you want to have a happy patient at the end. And well, there is another guy, Tadahiko Kawai. Um, he's, a, he's basically a pioneer of finite elemental analysis and he works in Tokyo University. And uh, well, he designed the, the, the basics of finite elemental with, with uh, rigid spring models. And this is the scientific work as a backing. Um, well, you can work through it in India. There, there might be some guys uh, being able to understand. Uh, I tell you, in Germany, our school system doesn't allow you to go through math like this. So I don't get 5% of this. Anyhow, I don't have to because there are smart engineers who told me how to apply this for human medicine. And this is Edmund Schau, who himself was an engineer. And basically, Edmund worked in the Mayo Clinic. And, um, and, the Mayo, and, and Edmund uh, worked as an, as an engineer in the Mayo Clinic, but himself did not carry out any surgeries. So, but Edmund had a good idea to apply the work from uh, Tadahiko uh, to his work regards knee osteotomies. And he thought, well, why don't we make a rigid bone spring model? And this rigid bone spring model uh, gives us some measurements around the knee. So this is what he did. And he fed it all into one software solution, the first ever artificial intelligence um, measurement tool that we had for, for osteotomies around the knee. And this software basically looked at the osteotomies being planned by the surgeons and recommended how to do it better. So taking a look at this example that shows us a Mikulic line at 100% medial. Exactly what I told you, the, the Mikulic line does not touch the knee anymore, or almost. Huh? So now you can convert this and plan an osteotomy, in this case, a lateral closing wedge, but you can also do a medial opening wedge. I mean, the shape of the osteotomy that was just back then in 2000, not considered to, uh, to be like a medial open, but anyhow, the lateral closing just for this severe um, um, uh, varus deformity would uh, cause something like this. So this is the offloading of the medial side, perfectly carried out, and Mikulic is running through the lateral compartment. Nicely seen here. But there is a nine-degree lateral tilt to the wrong side. So the joint line orientation is completely wrong. So the better answer would have been distributing this huge deformity to both levels. So then you have the same offloading of the medial side at 40% uh, medial loading. The, the same, same biomechanical aspects, the only thing basically that changed is the orientation of the joint line with another tilt of just 2.5% uh, lateral tilt, also bad enough, but way better than the other one. So unfortunately, um, Edmund was not uh, a surgeon himself, but it was Babis back then, Jorios Babis, who is now in Cappadocian University in Athens and not pretty much into um, osteotomies anymore. But anyhow, he was back then and he carried out these surgeries according the recommendations from the software, the OASIS system. And he found that 96% uh, of his osteotomies had a survival after seven years. So this is the best ever published mid or long-term data that we have on osteotomies about the knee. And this surprisingly on double level osteotomies. Miller, who? Miller. So what have we learned now? Well, we have learned that you cannot carry out all these um, deformities and, and uh, corrections at the tibia. The joint line is very important if you want to get it right, not just the Mikulic line. And if you want to perform it properly, then you need to encounter uh, the femoral osteotomy and put it all there as well. Now, 
Unfortunately, there is something in between, which is the joint line. And the joint line itself is expressed rather by shear forces or by wear and tear of the, of the uh, joint itself. And as we, with osteotomies, carry out extra articular corrections, uh, we have to react somewhat with our alignment correction to what happens basically due to our surgery on the level of the joint. Because your joint may have some joint line convergence angle of some degree, let's say eight in this example, but there is a tipping point. And when you bring over the weight to the contralateral side, it may react up to normal. So in this case, two degrees, because the JLCA range goes from two till minus two. So let's say we have a starting point eight, and it may react to two, but we don't know. A good option for us would be stress X-rays. But if you don't have any idea, you still have to take it into consideration that it reacts, because if you don't do this, you run directly into an overcorrection because you then bonily correct and then passively um, the joint line convergence angle reacts. And therefore, this is the source of overcorrection that you may have. So you need to reduce your first initial measurement and your planning by the amount of joint line correction error that you have. So the JLCA now, as said, may react from two till eight degrees, which is a range of six. So, but you don't know whether it basically uh, stays completely at two and then you under anticipated everything or uh, you over anticipate if it doesn't correct at all. So how to find out best? Well, you take a likely corridor in the middle, which is basically three degrees. So the rule of thumb is you take your measured joint line uh, correction, uh, joint line convergence angle, sorry, and subtract two in order to bring your measured angle to the normal value. And this is the range of correction that you may have. The range is six degrees. Well, if you just want to minimize your error in a range of six degrees, well, you divide it by two and then you come to three. So if you measure, for example, an overall correction of 15 degrees to come where you want to be and you have a joint line convergence angle of eight, then you need to reduce this measured angle by three degrees. Otherwise you may run into an overcorrection. So this is how we did it in the former times. This is why I made this video looking a little bit um, vintage. So this is the alignment that you have and you just need to make your analysis now. So you measure all the lines, joint lines and, um, and, uh, and the centers and the uh, axis. And once you have done this, you come up with a measurement for joint line convergence angle, MPTA and MLDFA. So, and if you now want to carry out a correction in a case where Mikulic is medial to the knee and you end up with a weight bearing, uh, with, a, with a correction of nine uncorrelated, which is here 18, well, this is quite high. So 18 millimeters medial opening, I haven't done for years. In most of these cases, I then distribute to both levels. And if you don't have digital planning, well, you need to take this planning into consideration and make it with scissors. So you just make your first correction at the femur and bring it to normal means. In this case, we started with the femur at 89 and 84 would still be okay. So the first five, degrees of correction go to the femur. And then you redo your Mikulic line and your virtual Mikulic line and completely com redo your planning. And then you end up with a final correction correlated of 10 degrees, which is way better than 18. But luckily today we have these digital opportunities to just carry out these plannings in a very, very simple attempt um, on a digital platform. And this is what is described here. And this is what Bushen already told us. You make your planning and you make your measurements and then you check where your malalignment is originated. Well, in this case, you see, now after placing 
everything at the right spot? Well, in this case, you see that there is an MPTA of 82 and an MLDFA of 91. So in fact, in fact, Mikulic line does not touch the knee anymore and the joint line convergence angle is five degrees. So in fact, here we see three malalignments, one at the MPTA, one at the MLDFA and one at the joint line convergence angle. And we don't look at the others. But if you want to get this done now, well, then you need three levels of correction. So this is why in this digital planning, we introduce three coras. Well, the Cora concept itself is rather not for osteotomies around the knee, it's rather for shaft corrections. But anyhow, let's call these Cora centers of rotation of angulation or, or correction points. So this is what we now put in. Now the final one for the joint correction and anticipation of what happens in the joint when we come closer to our tipping point. So now we put that in as well. And then we correct for the femur and for the tibia and for the joint itself. But now let's first look what happens if we just carry out our surgery at the tibial side. So we now perform our osteotomy starting at 82. You see this there. Rotate it and bring our Mikulic line to Fujisawa right here. So we end up with an osteotomy uh, a tibial value of 98, 100 degrees, way worse than the patient came with. Doesn't make sense, huh? Yeah. So we have spoken about why this doesn't make sense and the biologic, uh, biomechanical aspects. So now let's first, let's first change a little bit the joint line uh, convergence angle from five till two. So our rule of thumb was minus two divided by two. So three divided by two is 1.5 degrees. So uh, two degrees is what we correct from the uh, JLCA. Maybe this was like one degree too far, but anyhow, if you correct it to two or three, it doesn't really matter. So now we go for the femur. And after applying the changes to the femur, you see that the Mikulic line is now not on the medial side of the knee anymore, but in the center of the medial compartment. So then the overall osteotomy for the tibia becomes quite easy as we just have to put in some seven, eight centi uh, millimeters of change. So this would be a great correction. And you see that all these red figures here are converted into green. So that makes way more sense to carry out the, 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 the osteotomy like this uh, than the other way around. Okay, so this is how it then looks like. We can take the wedge from the femur and put it into the tibia. This is what I usually do. So I make an autologous bone uh, grafting or ha uh, harvesting and then grafting. So if you want to take a look at what we do and why we do, um, well, I work in London as well as in Hanover in the London Osteotomy Center with uh, Rackby and Adrian, but also other guys internationally renowned like uh, Ronald van Herwan. It's a great place to work at and uh, have lots of interesting cases. So you're um, invited to visit us there. And uh, another one that I want to share with you is this uh, virtual masterclass London knee osteotomy course. Um, it will, uh, well, there is no venue for it due to the pandemic, obviously. It's just virtual and will run at the 29th and 30th of April this year. So uh, we would be more than happy to welcome you there as, um, as our guests and uh, if you like this, what you learned here, there is plenty of other stuff that you see and uh, you're you are happily welcome. So thanks for the invitation again. Obviously I've spoken now way too long, but I'm looking forward to uh, uh, answering all your questions. Thanks again for the invitation. And that's, that's it from me now for so far. Dr. Christian, thank yes. you. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful uh, lecture and uh, we all had a lot to learn from that. Uh, now there are a few quick questions you would like to take and I would uh, also invite all our uh, panelists and uh, speakers to, to kindly switch on so that if there is any, uh, the questions could be taken. I think uh, Dr. Hemant Kalyan has some 
uh, one of the questions in the chat box. So would you like to go ahead with that? So I see some, I don't know if, if uh, I, I am, I'm just looking at the chat box. Okay, so let, me, some... let me read out a few of the questions. Yeah. Yeah, now, uh, first thing is, uh, what, is, what would be your take on a bone-on-bone -bone deformity? Yeah, so we have made a study in Hanover, which was a, basically it was a multi-center study. I have a, an echo again. So maybe we... Mute ourselves more. Yeah. So I, we've made a multi center study in Hanover, uh, Neymaren, and uh, Tübingen in, in Germany and, and Netherlands. And um, basically, we looked at uh, more than 500 uh, osteotomies we carried out. And we thought ourselves, obviously, we, we put our finger into the wound and say, well, um, does it really apply for patients having full thickness defect? Uh, what about age? Uh, what about obesity? All these questions, smoking. In fact, in fact, um, full thickness defect is not uh, a contraindication uh, for osteotomy. These patients perform very, very good if the indication is right. So you just need to take a look uh, at the indication. And the basic question is, is there a metaphysial deformity? If there is a metaphysial deformity, an, an osteotomy is a great tool. If there is no bony deformity at all, and you just see intra-articular wear, shoot for a uni. And if there is pan osteoarthritis uh, and, and you have full destruction of the joint without anything, well, then you go for a total knee, obviously. So, but if there is one healthy compartment, the question is just, is there, is there a metaphysial deformity? So there might now be both a metaphysial deformity and a full thickness defect. Well, then the question always is, what was before, chicken or egg? Well, um, I usually then just look at my patients and ask them and take a look at the age, for example. So I'm not really keen to put in unis and 40-year-old guys being sportive and, and active. So, but that's the only question that I have. In fact, this... Um, this former question always of debating on a course and setting unis uh, against osteotomy. I, I don't go to these debates anymore when being invited because I say, well, there is just little overlap. I don't have a, I don't have a, a dispute there anyway because I'm doing like one third osteotomies, one third unis, one third totals. So this is my personal percentage. Thank you, uh, Dr. Christian. Now, uh, there are a couple of other questions here. Uh, I hope you don't mind taking them as well right now. All of them. Yeah. What is your take on, uh, have you had any experiences of HTO without implants, only with a bone graft? Yeah. Well, not on a routine base, I have to confess. The only surgeries I do, uh, um, HDOs with, without, well, I don't graft them anyhow. I don't graft most of them because we don't have allografts in Germany. This, this, there is a legal restriction. So they heal by themselves. That's not a problem. But I have some experiences in one particular subgroup of these treatments without any, without any stabilization. And that is funny. So if I make slope changes, and I take ilia crest bone grafts that I, that I put in from the front uh, and, and alter the slope, then I don't take any uh, implants at all. Um, I usually leave uh, the tibial tubercle uh, um, attached. I don't release that for these procedures anymore. And I just hammer in, tap in the bone grafts from the front and I don't take any plate for those cases. And the, and the weight of the patient alone is enough to basically uh, bring it to healing. So that looks weird sometimes, and obviously you need to dare it and you need to believe in the construct, but it, osteotomies even work without anything. So it's in fact very versatile and it, it depends on what you want to achieve and what you want to correct and, and how you trust in your stability and your constructs. So I use plates for normal HTOs, um, obviously, but but I don't have access to grafts. 
So we we all believe that uh, any correction over eight millimeters needs to be augmented with either a graft or a etcher block or whatever it is. Yeah. What is your well, there is, well, there is. Well, there is. Well, as I said, I, I don't graft. That's the answer. The thing is that there is a good study from Staubli that you can bring even 22 millimeters of opening to healing. As a matter of fact, since I'm doing lots of these cases, as uh, when the last osteotomy, high tibial osteotomy, above 15 millimeters I performed was years ago. Years ago, due to the fact that I have the strong belief that most of these cases then are double level osteotomies, which reduces my overall height of osteotomy, the gap height. And so therefore, most of my osteotomies are just eight, nine, 10, six millimeters. And uh, when you have an osteotomy at just six till 10 millimeters, you don't have to graft it anyhow. It heals by itself. Okay. Uh, uh, the last question we would uh, take before this is, uh, what is, why is, why is your preferred surgery? Uh, open wedge rather than a closed wedge osteotomy, one question. The second question mm -hmm. uh, is about the hinge screw. What diameter screw do you use and what is the trajectory you, you would like to use that screw at? Yeah, so um, basically opening or closed wedge, um, well, is, is, is your preferred choice. So if you um, if you are a traditional surgeon and you say, I don't believe in the construct of medial opening wedge uh, high tibial osteotomy, but I have done like uh, for years lateral closing wedges, well, you know what? My perspective is um, unless you, I mean, if, if you do osteotomies anyhow, then you should take them in your armamentarium. And I'm glad for every surgeon who osteotomizes. You know, I'm not here to baptize you and to kind of convert you and flip you to make you a medial opener um, if you are a lateral closer. So if that works for you, well, it, it works for me. Um, anyhow, I think the medial open wedge in my hands has advantages that I, uh, that this is why I promote this technique. But um, if someone else likes to do it the other way around, well, fair to go. Um, for the femur, I personally feel that um, that I like to close it, as I told you, uh, the the it, the bone is brittle, the lever arm is longer, and the uh, and the the whole surface of osteotomy is smaller. So therefore, the femur is under risk. It's a, it's a very brittle bone, and as a as a result, my rule is factam, F A C T A M. Femur always closed, tibia always medial. That's what I do. So, and with this regime, you can treat all deformities. So the next question was regards the hinge screw. Well, um, I have to admit, I, I, uh, the more I work in, in London, the more I put in hinge screws routinely. So um, this is not because English hinges are, are weaker than Germans. It's basically, uh, it's basically the setup that we have there. And um, I try to implement that into my German workflow here. Anyhow, a hinge screw is, is a great achievement. And I've just recently operated on a colleague um, uh, I'm, I admire really. And I flew to him, operated on him, a distal femoral osteotomy, and I put in two hinge screws. And this bloke weighed uh, 119 kilos. So quite a, quite a solid, solid boy. And uh, three days after the surgery, he fell down the stairs. So we made a CT scan and he had a fracture around the hinge. But anyhow, the hinge screws saved everything. So without hinge screws, that would have at 100% been a revision surgery. But with these hinge screws, we were able to just keep going. So a hinge screw is a great idea. And, and well, if you've ever applied it to your work, you probably will not like to miss it. Thank you, Dr. Christian. It was, uh, it was great having you here. We still have two talks to go from our local I will join. From I, I will join you. Oh, that would be fantastic. That would be great. Uh, we would be very delighted to have you and have your inputs in the further topics as well. Now, I would uh, like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Mohan to uh, 
kindly go on with this topic am i audible yeah my screen is on okay uh, thank you dr chirag and uh, bangalore orthoscopy club for uh, inviting me uh, for talk on uh, hto with the acl reconstruction now uh, we have heard a very good talk by dr bhushan subnis and uh, dr christian clay about uh, the deformity corrections now we have a particular uh, set of subset of patients who are young unstable and present with mal alignment so when we presented with such a subset of patients now how to go to my next slide next slide it's not moving I'm not able to change my slide. One second. yeah now it's uh, it started so uh, uh, when you are presented with this uh, young unstable knee with mal alignment uh, so what are the treatment options we are left with uh, is it osteotomy alone a two stage procedure where osteotomy first followed by uh, ligament reconstruction later or a combined acl and osteotomy at the same setting uh, so let's see the uh, what is the effect of mal alignment on the acl ligament now this biomechanical study done by jan et al uh, which showed that uh, increased varus alignment and an increased posterior slope can contribute to instability in a acl deficient knee or in a acl reconstructed case uh, increased stress on the acl graft itself now there was a a, a, a finite element uh, study done by hinkel et al which uh, uh, found out that in the coronal plane if there's an increase in the varus by about 5 degree or even 10 degree uh, there is increased uh, stress on the ligament by three or four folds Now, similarly in the sagittal plane uh, webb and colleagues have found out that uh, if you see in this image a normal uh, a slope the amount of uh, anterior tibial translation but as soon as the slope is increased the translation becomes almost three to three times or if the slope is reduced the translation reduces they found that if the posterior tibial slope is greater than 12 degree they had five times uh, chance of recurrent acl injury and 59% incidence of retear or reinjury now coming to the indications for a combined acl and a hto uh, basically a medial compartment oa which is an alback grade 1 to 3 with the varus mal alignment with an acl tear a uh, similar uh, medial compartment oa with varus mal alignment with a failed acl reconstruction or a failed acl reconstruction because of a increased tibial slope uh, double or triple varus as described by noise along with an acl tear so these are the indications for the acl with an hto now it is just not uh, the uh, Uh, the presentation what we see it is also the clinical aspects has to be taken uh, some young uh, unstable malaligned knee may not have uh, significant features of uh, uh, instability but more of only a medial medial uh, joint line tenderness which is more severe so in those in those cases it's the surgeon's decision to do either only an osteotomy or to do a combined procedure Now, the relative contraindications are basically uh, contraindications for the osteotomy itself like patellofemoral arthritis 
severe damage of medial compartment like ALBAC 4 and 5, tricompartmental arthritis, uh, fixed uh, flexion contractures, age greater than 50, obesity, and also smokers. Now, the pre-op planning basically starts with a, a, a standard as for the uh, osteotomy in terms of scanograms to find out the mechanical axis and to see how much of correction needs to be assessed. The other important thing uh, uh, in an ACL plus a HTO is basically to assess the TBL slope, uh, which has to be assessed in the lateral view. The normal slope range can be somewhere between 0 to 18, but when it is exceeding more than 10, uh, the slope should be decreased to reduce the tension on a reconstructed ACL. Now, the graft of choice, most of the uh, literature prefers a, a soft tissue graft uh, just to avoid the graft tunnel mismatch, which can happen with a bone patella tendon or a quadriceps graft. But uh, it is not always a must. You can still do uh, HTO and an ACL with any, any graft also. Now, the surgical procedure, because you're combining two procedures, ACL and HTO, uh, the procedure to be followed is to harvest the graft first, uh, then do an arthroscopy in terms of identifying any intraarticular pathology like addressing the chondral lesions or the meniscal lesions, and then do the femoral tunnel. Once the femoral tunnel is done, go, the next step would be to do an osteotomy and do a preliminary fixation, and then do the tibial tunnel so that there is no convergence between the screw from the plate and the tibial tunnel. Once the tibial tunnel is done, then to do uh, the final fixation and then the graft fixation. Now, femoral tunnel, any method is fine, uh, except the transtibial drilling because uh, the transtibial depends on the tibial tunnel where you have to do the tibial tunnel after the osteotomy, so it may interfere. So either a transportal, uh, uh, transportal femoral or an outside in femoral uh, tunnel uh, drilling would be fine. Now, osteotomy part, uh, it's the surgeon's preferred choice. Uh, I usually do uh, this technique where I guide where is position under fluoroscopic guidance. Then the collateral uh, ligaments are partially detached and prevent, uh, protected. And uh, using an oscillating saw, which is parallel to the TBS slope, uh, cut the medial, anterior, and posterior cortices, leaving the hinge behind. Now, if you see this, uh, uh, the important thing in the osteotomy part is the plate uh, ideally uh, needs to be more posterior for two reasons. One is you get uh, uh, more space anteriorly to plan your tibial tunnel without the interference of the plate. And second thing is placing the plate more posterior uh, it also helps you to prevent from increasing the tibial slope, which can happen if the plate is more anterior and you're opening it more anterior. So those are the two reasons, specific reasons, uh, when you're combining with the ACL reconstruction. Now, the tibial tunnel part, uh, uh, as the plate is placed more posterior and the screws are only, the posterior screws are placed, anterior screws are left free. And then using a, a, a tibial jig, you make a tunnel anterior to the plate. And once the tunnel is made, the tunnel, uh, uh, you keep a, a, a dilator, a tunnel dilator in the tunnel, and then uh, plan for fixation of the anterior screw so that they don't interfere, uh, uh, so that the screw comes in the tunnel and prevents the graft passage or fixation. Now, this is uh, uh, by uh, uh, Christian Clay and team, they have uh, done, they do a uh, uh, what is called as a patient specific cutting guide where you do a pre-op CT and then plan uh, the cutting jig as well as the plate. Now where they incorporate even the tibial tunnel uh, jig so that uh, it doesn't interfere with the screw positions where you are placing the tunnel so that you can do a preliminary, uh, the final fixation itself before doing the tibial tunnel also. Uh, the rear protocol uh, basically depends on the osteotomy, rigidity of the fixation, as well as the, the surgeon's preference. Usually, it's a partial weight bearing up to four weeks, then followed by full weight bearing. The rest of the ACL rehab protocol follows the same. But there are a few studies where few surgeons are very conservative, being non-weight bearing in the initial phase. But the only issue is it uh, delays the whole rehab protocol. Now, the literature review uh, regarding this combined ACL and uh, HTO, uh, largely there are hundreds of studies. All of them uh, concentrate on only the clinical outcome of this one stage study. Uh, there is no randomized uh, study uh, differentiating between uh, combined ACL and HTO with only either an HTO or an ACL. 
so they most of the studies uh, say that uh, they have improved uh, post operative ik disease score and uh, very less uh, reoperation rates so this was one more study uh, uh, from our own indian uh, study from coimbatore where they study uh, a single stage anterior ligament reconstruction with high tibial osteotomy and its relation to the posterior slope and they found that placing the graft posterior to the midline in the opening reduces the posterior tibial slope and thereby reduces the stresses on the graft leading to a better functional outcome now uh, in, in in conclusion i would say that uh, hto plus acl reconstruction um, helps in significant improvement in the post operative functional subjective outcomes however it remains unclear if uh, hto with aclr aclr is Uh, superior to only aclr or a uh, hto alone lack of the randomized control studies overall uh, is found this surgery is found to have low complication rates re ruptures and need for revision surgeries thank you thank you dr mohan for uh, very nicely summarizing this thing uh, the subject now i just have one question more as a devil advocate for you devil advocate for you that you know we been all doing one stage hto along with uh, i mean medial wedge opening hto along with acl single stage uh, is there an argument to say that if you had to do a two stage procedure and you did the hto at the first stage then probably you may not need the aclr at all in say a 40 42 year old person with significant varus and acl deficiency uh, there is a contribution to the instability from the deformity and there is a contribution to the instability from the acl so would there be an argument in an older individual maybe 45 plus to just do the hdo and see if he has instability and do second stage acl absolutely sir it is a, a valid option and uh, it is entirely a, a surgeon's preference uh, but acl acl itself uh, can produce uh, uh, a chronic acl deficiency can produce postromedial wear which can lead to worsening of the uh, the varus deformity even post uh, it bell osteotomy so that option is always there so depending upon the instability symptoms and the malalignment symptoms the surgeon's preference he can do a two stage procedure also the other good point to me was about the posterior tibial slope you know and we know that uh, when there is a unrecognized posterior tibial slope of say more than 10 11 12 degrees the rate of uh, acl re rupture uh graft rupture is more than 50% in some series so would you advocate that as part of the routine workup for acl surgery we should uh, measure the posterior tibial slope and uh, if need be you know do the correction at the same sitting as a routine more more than for the routine i think it is uh, definitely to be done in all failed acl reconstructions dr mohan you are muted no sir i'm not muted pardon yeah. yeah for all for all the failed acls uh, it is uh, a must to do a lateral uh, view to know the tibial slope and correct it uh, if required as part of the revision acl but routinely for all acls uh, i would not suggest but if you have any doubt at all then routine uh, can get a proper standing lateral view to rule out uh, the increase in the tibial slope dr christian in your series of uh, patients how many of your osteotomies have you done for uh, salvaging failed acl procedures you know where you've had either uh, the graft re ruptures and then you found that the problem has been posterior tibial slope and uh, how many of them have you had to revise for this reason it's been less than 1% sir yes, failed failed acl uh, because of a increased slope dr christian wait wait now i am now i am unmuted so um 
Well, overall, I have to admit that we kind of stop uh, combined procedures, really combined procedures in our practice in Hanover a couple of years ago. So the data set that we have from our new study is, is um, isolated data set that we have from the Marseille work group around Mathieu Olivier. So um, the reason why I'm doing that is uh, basically um, uh, from Dr. Hemant already given. And I found this a very wise remark. The question really is, is it, is it of importance uh, to do these procedures always combined? Or couldn't we just say, well, we give it five degrees more of extension uh, and therefore we tackle uh, the, uh, the instability and maybe uh, get away with one easier surgery instead of overdoing the case for the patient? Well, I guess, I guess, and we, we are all there aligned. Dr. Mohan is not speaking about these patients uh, being 40 plus that would be uh, with a little bit of extension well treated. We speak about the, the, the individual which is young, young at age, maybe 25 years with a sportive, uh, with a sportive demand. And uh, obviously you can treat those together um, or you have to maybe treat those together. Uh, anyhow, conversion rates themselves are low to the fact that we rather treat the patients from the aspect that we say osteotomy goes first, then goes the ligament. If you'd be taking it from the other way around and say first we do the ligament and then we maybe do the, do the osteotomy, then you go to conversion problems. Dr. Uh, this is a question regarding the total meniscectomy patients. You know, people who had uh, total medial meniscectomies or subtotal medial meniscectomies maybe 25 years ago, probably open meniscectomies. Uh, have you had these patients coming back to you now with medial compartmental osteoarthritis, which you have had to tackle with? Uh, with HTO or double osteotomy? Yeah, yeah. These patients come, obviously, we call this a post meniscectomy osteoarthritis, but this specific subgroup of patients um, quite often is a sub cohort which was not necessarily be associated um, with a metaphyseal deformity. So if these patients basically just suffer now from a post meniscectomy osteoarthritis, which leads to isolated full thickness wear with in absence, in absence of bony disorder. I used to treat these patients uh, with unicondylar replacements. So um, because this is like prolonged, they are 50 plus anyhow. So I would say um, three quarters of those patients rather go for unis than for osteotomies. I think this is in line with you. you I, see, I see your response and you are agreeing. So the same counts there, I guess, huh? Yeah, to all the expert speakers. Metaphysial varus. If you don't have metaphysial varus, then uh, HTO is not required, essentially. So these patients have median collapse caused by uh, overloading due to lack of the medial meniscus. So, uh, and they they come quite late in the advanced arthritis. And anyone over 50 yeah. with this kind of arthritis is the ideal for a human. Uh, as long as it is okay, okay before before we just move on to the next topic a very very relevant question here all of us have this dilemma you get an MRI uh, plan for HTO and you hear uh, medial tibial condyle osteonecrosis does that alter your plan to Dr. Christian and uh, to Dr. Bushan both I didn't get the question. I don't know if, if that was addressed to me, but anyhow, I have a, a terrible echo here. Could you, could you uh, repeat that patient, question? Uh, in a pre-operative planning, the patient planned yes. for the HTO. Yes. And on an MRI, you see that the patient has a medial uh, tibial condyle osteonecrosis. Yeah. Now, does that alter your plan? 
that alters the plan. Uh, uh, necrosis is something which is which is well treated uh, with the unicondylar replacement, obviously. Um, well, but anyhow, uh, still the question is, is there metaphysical deformity? As this is the only statistical uh, classifier that we basically uh, found to be valid over the years. So we have seen um, even necrotic areas that transformed uh, to, uh, to vital uh, or revitalized uh, areas. So the question then would rather be, how old is the patient? What about the demands of the patient? Is it a, a case for a salvage procedure? So um, let's say these are a little bit the, the little mockingbirds that come around. So you rarely see them and uh, they distract our sight somewhat from the 95% from the of patients that are really quite straight shooters and obvious. So um, I would say, let's focus on the ones that really are of importance because we tend to see them daily in our practice and all the other ones, well, obviously we need we need to have decisions for them, but most of these decisions are rather based on individual um, cases than on, on guidelines that we can give our colleagues at the end. So 95% of all the cases are clear. 5% of the cases, unfortunately, are, are complex and complicated. In these cases, you know what I tend to do is, I, tend, I, I, I send them to another colleague just to reassure myself. Why not about this solution? I mean, Sometimes you just need to have a broader scope. So, but yes, um, it changes my regime. Personally, if I decide on that and the patient is old enough for uni, I tend to go for uni. Uh, can I have one more question? To all the yes. experts, when we are doing a ACL with a high TBL osteotomy, uh, regarding the choice of implants, I mean, if we find the tomofix there's a lot of conflict of the screw space and the TBL tunnels. And do, we, do you think it's a better option to go for the other smaller plates, Pudu plates, or maybe a lateral closed wedge with staples? Well, um, as, you, as you have seen that I changed my practice to, uh, to new clip, uh, as the plates are um, finita elementa controlled uh, by... Um, and, and controlled uh, in the same uh, setting as the uh, um, Tomofix by uh, Pape in uh, Luxembourg in the Roman Zeil section. Well, these plates are very solid and stable and equal, uh, thus the uh, dimensions are smaller. So um, I changed to those plates and there is a specifically designed plate for, um, for uh, ACL plus HTO um, in one go. So anyhow, um, there is an option to do it with a Tomofix, and we did it back then. You just leave out some of the screws that are of risk. Mostly it's, a, uh, it's, it's B and C. So you just leave them out, and then you check with the, with the scope inside of the tunnel whether you encounter problems with these screws intersecting. And once that uh, is the case, then you obviously leave out those screws and make them shorter. So that's the workaround if you use a Tomofix. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, can I you're welcome. Uh, inputs. Uh, I think we can go on to the next speaker. Dr. Sharad Kiar is going to talk about medial meniscal root. Gentlemen, un unfortunately, one announcement from my side. I have to now quit because I got my kids here. Um, uh, I, I know that this is like, it's like always in life. So I, I want to say thank you once again for having me and uh, see you next time, hopefully then in person again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. It was an honor and pleasure okay. from, for us all to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Dr. Sharat? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting a case of uh, Hestiva with medial meniscus root repair. I cannot... Uh... So this is a 47-year-old uh, lady with uh, extruded uh, medial meniscus uh, with a uh, uh, 
tear of the posterior uh, root of the medial meniscus. So you can see the various malalignment of the uh, both lower limbs in the scanogram. So I decided to uh, do medial meniscus uh, root reattachment. So the steps would be uh, to do arthroscopic uh, uh, medial meniscus, uh, uh, taking bites uh, in the posterior root of the medial meniscus. Here, uh, visualizing the root of the uh, torn root and uh, seeing other uh, areas if there is any tear. And uh, uh, using uh, the standard uh, uh, two, uh, fiber, uh, two, number two fiber wire and, uh, and uh, tiger wire. And here, uh, the bed of the uh, attachment site is being uh, 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 created for the better vascularity. And uh, at this stage, uh, we, re we take out uh, two threads uh, from uh, medial portal, and then we'll move and go, go ahead with the, uh, the osteotomy. Uh, you can see the, the wires, uh, two uh, threads are from the medial portal, and then uh, uh, this is the, the standard uh, osteotomy. And uh, here again, the, the vertical limb of the osteotomy. And after this stage, uh, we fix the plate and then uh, we, we uh, with the root jig, we make the guide wires at the area of the uh, area, uh, the posterior root we have uh, created, and then uh, with the 4.5 4 mm uh, uh, drill bit, we make the tunnel. So then uh, we uh, retrieve the, uh, with, uh, the with the suture retriever, uh, the shuttle the the threads to the tunnel, and uh, we fix the. Uh, we can fix the uh, with with the ABS button in the anterior aspect of the tibia. So here uh, I would like to. Uh, this is the final picture. The fixation of the ABS button is done in the lateral aspect. Uh, uh, this is the the follow up X-rays, and I would like to uh, uh, show that uh, as it was discussed uh, before. Uh, this is the uh, the orientation of the screws in the tomo fix. So in the tomo fix, uh, the more higher we go uh, in the tibia and uh, uh, the more medial we go, we can direct the screws to the posterior aspect. The more, uh, more uh, below, uh, down we go, it will go to the uh, posteriorly. So this is a small uh, exercise where the tomo fix plate is being fixed and seen how the guide the, the guide wire can be passed for the root here as you can see that in the tomo fix in the uh, middle aspect we will never be able to fix the uh, the the root because even though the guide wire goes the 4.5 mm uh, drill bit will not be able to go we can go in the more anterior aspect you can see here, it is obstructing. If the same same uh, screw lens, if we overlap over the proximal tibia and see the second screw uh, in the, the middle screw in the top is the one which always uh, obstructs our tunnel. So if, if we reduce if we reduce the tunnel, if we reduce the second screw, then we'll be able to make the make the tunnel from the medial side in any any of the direction. So this is one uh, uh, thing which we have to consider whenever we are using you are doing the tomo fix. So the posterior screw don't don't have to be removed. The middle screw or anterior screw we have to change. So most of the times it is a middle screw which will have to be uh, reduced in length whenever we are doing the posterior uh, root reattachment. So the same thing which was discussed before, uh, if we are using uh, the arthrex uh, plate, 
probably this work is this will be a little bit uh, easier uh, compared to the tomophic plate but there will be biomechanical uh, differences of the osteotomy uh, so so this is the arthrex uh, uh, plate where the the fixation is uh, far more uh, easier uh, compared to the tomofix but uh, as was discussed before with uh, dr mohan we have to put the plate a little bit posterior and reduce the second uh, top screw in order to make the tunnel uh, in the tibia thank you for your kind attention Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Sharad, yeah. uh, that, I, I think uh, that's a that's a good uh, good technique. What what has been uh, uh, shown to us probably uh, one of the techniques or one of the tips what we follow in our uh, in our practice when we do uh, simultaneous root repair with uh, with an high tip osteotomy is first we drill out our uh, our tunnel for the for the root repair and then place the four mm. Uh, jig there. I mean, a uh, drill bit there, and then, then uh, try to manipulate and and play along with the screws. And uh, it's most common in uh, Tomofix. We can skip off one screw. All we need is two proximal screws. So usually in uh, stable fixations, when we have a good lateral hinge, I think that should be adequate. And nevertheless, uh, any input from uh, Hemant sir or. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, that's exactly what Mon described, you know, in the ACL plus HPO combination, where you can put a lantrocar or a dilator into the tunnel. So basically, if you obstruct the tunnel with a solid instrument, in this case, just with a 4.5 mm drill bit, uh, that's more than enough for you to make sure that there'll be no conflict of the screws. And uh, typically, if you... Uh, you know, in your diagram, you showed your uh, the plate more anteriorly, in which case the direction of the screws will be it's, it's the way you've seen in the diagram. But yes. if you shift the whole orientation posteriorly, the posterior screw can be the normal length. The anterior screw and probably the middle screw can be script, skipped and the anterior screw can be shorter and you will unlikely to have a conflict. Yes. So that way you may not need to put the ABS button all the way to the lateral side. Yes, sir. So, so that means uh, the, uh, the button can be in the medial side also. Yes, yes, yes. Blessing in disguise, uh, we, we usually, after a root repair, we do keep, it, keep the patient non-weight bearing for about uh, six weeks' time. At least I do that. So that would also uh, uh, help us with the osteotomy healing. Now, Shall we move on to the next most weighted topic for the evening? We have amongst us uh, Dr. Satish Sharvagar, sir, who himself has had a high TBL osteotomy. And uh, of all his experiences, I mean, I think uh, he had a, probably a metaphysical virus with the with root tear, with the root tear of his poshihan of medial meniscus. And uh, he did undergo a high tubular osteotomy. I, I think he underwent only a high tubular osteotomy without a root repair. Uh, we would like like him to share his experiences. And also, I would like uh, Dr. Gautam Konikal, Dr. Hemant sir, and uh, uh, Anand Galgali sir to uh, kindly have a, a take on this session. Yeah, you, you'll have to ask the questions. Satish, yeah. I can yeah. hear you. Yes, I can hear. So tell us how you how you decided to go for this research. Uh, I had uh, I started getting a knee pain more on the back side of the knee. It was for some six months. And this pain sometimes is to be shooting in nature. And it is to increase when I used to do hamstring exercise in the gym. Whenever I did, and I felt that this hamstring, vigorous hamstring exercise in the gym with weights, pulling the weight behind might be the cause of this 
some addition to this uh, damage. So, and uh, x-ray was normal, nothing. Clinically, I have a virus of both knees. So I knew that that will create some problem. So we took x-ray and we could see that line was going medial to the superior line point. Then uh, we got MRI done. MRI showed a posterior horn tear, but no OA changes in the joint in the MRI. I waited for six months. Pain was reduced. Pain was reducing as a clinician, as an arthroscopist for 30 years. I always say uh, this meniscus uh, tear or whatever cause for pain, it will settle one day. Meniscus, I personally feel not a great issue. But the virus of the knee is something which will trouble your future in life. So I spoke to the senior consultant and he advised a HTO with a root repair. But I took some time uh, for some reason or the other trips and also I wanted to delay. So it took nearly six months. So when he went in, he saw that the posterior horn and posterior one third or whatever of the lateral meniscus was worn off. There was nothing much left there. So he didn't do a root repair. He went straight away and did a, a high tibial osteotomy. It was very precise and, and the pain, that pain never came again. Yes, but uh, I'm, uh, most of us do STO for osteoarthritis knee. I did it before the osteoarthritis sets in. So now I have a knee which is both non-osteoarthritis. One is still in virus and one is straight. In 10 years, I'll tell you what uh, what happens to the virus knee. Does nothing happen or something happens? Satish, I have a question. Yeah. Satish, was the HTO pre-planned or was only root repair was planned initially and then they did the HTO? No, the HTO was pre-planned because as in a virus knee, if you only do a root repair, it will tear again because it's a stress on that thing which is tearing it. So you have to remove the stress. And I had suggested to the surgeon that whether you get a root or not root, do I want HTO done. So I was not personally much worried about the root. I don't know. <laughs> so and uh, when they came in, there was I'd like to ask uh, yes. Dr. Sharath here, that, uh, can you tell us the rationale of Doing the root repair along with your HTO. You want, you want Dr. Sharath to answer? This question is to Dr. Sharath? Yeah, yeah to Dr. Sharath. Hello, sir. Sir. Sir, repeat your question. Sir, repeat the question, sir. I didn't hear. No, uh, based on Dr. Satish's experience, what is your rationale of doing the root repair along with the HTO? Sir, uh, uh, I, I feel a root repair is, uh, is if uh, meniscus is extruded and the root is torn, and uh, uh, we will protect the root repair uh, by doing HTO, sir. That is the protection of root repair for HTO, sir. That's, that's what I, I feel. I agree, but then supposing you do the HTO without the root. Yes, yes, the, yes, even that can be done, sir. Even that can be really done. Many studies and, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, recent uh, papers and ISACOS, they recommend uh, uh, HTO itself without uh, uh, root repair. If we are not very clear of root repairs, uh, because they, they say only HTO itself uh, will offload the, uh, the thing. But uh, there are other uh, uh, arguments that if root is not there, then it is uh, amounts to the absence of meniscus. So uh, we have to just balance uh, between the patients. That's what I feel, sir. No, individuals uh, below the age of 50 years, low BMI, high activity demanding individual, and left and grade two osteoarthritis, 11 are candidates with the HTO. Okay. 
I think that should yeah. define our. Yeah, that, that's the thing. Yes. If if someone is fifty-five, I think it's just uh, uh, wise, wise to get just the HTO without the. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes. no, Sadish, good judgment. But, Hello? but age is just in the. Yeah, but he is. Not, <laughs> for Sadish, age is just quite young in his mind. Yeah, and, uh, he's only 25. As far as <laughs> no, but I can tell you as surgeons. Also, Sadish, uh, Sadish sir, did you have a augment like in, in, in terms of bone graft or. Uh, no, or, it, uh, it was a 9 mm opening. It was a 9 mm opening, and Dr. Tapaswi said till 11 mm he doesn't use bone graft. And he advised full weight bearing from the day one. I delayed it by a few weeks. But let me tell you, for me, it was like a cosmetic surgery. And it's very painful. Bone surgeries are very painful and nagging <laughs> for one month, one and a half months. <laughs> We just laugh at patients, but it is just, it will make you mad mentally sometime when the night pains are there. Hey, why, why was it painful? We have seen videos of post op people jumping and doing exercise. and I think surgeons are more sensitive. <laughs> there might be something with it, I don't know. I have done, I have got abdominal soft laparoscopy surgeon for hernia and all. The pain never bothered me. The next day I was walking around, but this bone pain was a nagging pain. I don't know. Irritating when you sleep, you know, it spoils your sleep. And... Immediate post op, you are not happy, but after say one year down the lane, you are okay now? I don't know. I told now, after 10 years only, we can say how my, you know, really, how we compare the, uh, the opposite knee to this knee. And for me, frankly, it was a cosmetic surgery. No, no, pre op and post op. And I'll tell on a you, pain I'll scale, tell you, how do you create it? I'll tell you one funny story. After that, I got the same pain in the opposite knee. And I, I'm i sure I got a root tear there. Suddenly, I was walking <laughs> and I got And I just ignored it for six months. Now, I have no pain. This is only for orthopedic surgery, not for patients. But uh, yes, the loading of... Offloading is important. You might have more OA changes in years to come. So, what will be your advice to a patient with the virus with the root tear now if somebody comes to you? Ah, patient is different, you are paid different. <laughs> the, the final answer no, for any surgery is that uh, would you have it on the other knee and will you recommend it to somebody else in your family? So, so how do you answer the question now? Having gone through a. If only osteoarthritis, only osteoarthritis is there. Would you do it on the other knee? Recommend. Yeah, if no osteoarthritis, I'll not recommend. I might have gone one step earlier than others. So only time will tell. But touch osteoarthritis will set in. But uh, the point now is that pain, what you suffered, you better suffer with a total knee than do a THTO. That is another discussion. Okay, I, think, I think it's about yeah. time to uh, wind up. Uh, Nein, Chira, I think maybe you should not send a wrong message to all the participants. Maybe it is one, one single experience of one yes, surgeon. Yes, yes, yes. So if you... Maybe Dr. Christian or Dr. Sapnis with a different opinion or because they would have seen plenty of cases and that very is more important. Very true, very true. So, I, so it is good to have your opinion, Dr. Sadish. But yeah, by, by large, I think so. Uh, high TBL osteotomy is uh, coming back again and uh, more and more surgeons are inclined now. And the indications of high, high TBL osteotomy is not only limited to. Uh, to osteoarthritis anymore. They are, they are now uh, spreading their tentacles towards ligament instability, right. chronic ligament injuries, root tears, and of course, even cartilage defects. Uh, bigger cartilage defects like uh, bigger OCDs, which would require a cartilage work, and would also offload that compartment with high degree osteoarthritis. I think, I think by large, uh, high degree osteoarthritis and DFO. I think our threshold as surgeons uh, should. Uh, should reduce towards doing high tibial osteotomy. And uh, we should also probably, as uh, Dr. Krishan said, we should uh, include 
distal femoral osteotomy as as a routine practice based surgery because it's a with a very very underrated and underdone surgery in uh, to to sum it up all high tibial osteotomy doesn't burn any bridge as compared to a uni or a total knee replacement it's a totally extra articular surgery just a alignment chain surgery which doesn't burn any bridge in terms of osteoarthritis or uh, the future plans of, uh, of any sort of a progression of arthritis as well as a good surgery well done and well done at, uh, with, with precision i think it's got a uh, got a longevity of many years uh, let's wind up the session and i would from bangalore arthroscopy club i would first of all thank uh, dr vishan for taking out his time dr bushan tablets for for making himself available uh, and to all our local faculty panelists and uh, the members who have made an effort to come here and uh, all the viewers who have been online uh, this is the first attempt to from the bangalore arthroscopy club to be online and uh, visual uh, virtual and physical uh, let's hope we have many more of this to come thank you all thank, thank you, you. Well done, Chirag. Well done. Nice. Very interesting. Good. Good job. Hello, sir. How are you?